Amen. If you have a copy of God's Word this morning, let me invite you to take it out. Maybe turn on your device to John chapter 19. John chapter 19. When you read the Bible, the Bible is full of stories. There are lots of stories throughout the whole Bible. We have the beginning in Genesis 1, the story of creation, the story of the first man and woman and Adam and Eve. You follow along in the Bible, you'll find the story or the, the characters of Noah and the flood. Uh, you'll find the stories of, of Abraham, the, the father of a nation, and Isaac, his son. You'll find the stories of a, a small shepherd boy who killed a giant and became a king, and David, a, a poet and a, a songwriter. You'll find the story of, of Jonah, who was swallowed by a great fish and spit out on the third day. The, throughout the Bible, there are all of these stories. You'll find in the New Testament the story of uh, the lame walking and the blind seeing and people walking on water and bread multiplying. And we find all of these characters and stories in the scripture. And the Bible is full of and overwhelmed with lots of stories. But here's the glorious truth of the scripture. All of the stories, all of the characters, all of the little narratives and the unfolding, all of the poetry and the psalms and the prophecies, all of the stories are truly about one story. It is one theme. All of the characters, all of the settings, all of the unraveling, all of the, the nail-biting tension of what will happen next, all of it points to one character and one story. And that character is Christ Jesus our Lord. And that story is his coming. His coming in order to die and be buried and raised from the grave. You see, brothers and sisters, as we celebrate this Easter holiday, this Easter season, we are reminded that the Bible, while it is full of characters and full of stories, the Bible is one story with one main character. And the one story is Jesus Christ. And the one main work of Christ is his death, burial, and resurrection. All of the Bible, all of its focus rests on the shoulders of our Savior. It is Christ. Christ is the center of the story. And there is no center place in Christ more prevalent, more seen, more focused than the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. For without the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, Jesus just becomes another character in the Bible that can't save us, that can't help us. But because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, the entire Bible becomes his story. The entire focus becomes his life and work. We are celebrating Christ. I've told you over the last few weeks as we've been walking through the last hours of Jesus in the Gospel of John. The last two weeks together, we began in chapter 18 and we see Jesus arrested in the garden. And then we see him go before the Sanhedrin and he's dragged before Pilate and he is left alone by himself. And today we will pick up the story in the last part of chapter 19 and we will see him accepted in his death. Jesus is arrested, he is left alone, and now he will die and his death will be accepted by the Father. We are walking with this. Now I remind you, that I have told you each week as we've opened this story and we've talked of Jesus, that I am fully aware that most, if not all of us, though there may be some of you here that are new to the story of Jesus, it is a curiosity to you and we are so thankful that you are here to hear this story, the greatest story ever told, the only story that matters in all of eternity, the one story that ties all stories together is Christ. We're glad you're here. We're glad you're tuning in. We're glad you're listening. But I realize that for the majority of us in the room, we have heard the Easter story. We have heard the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. We have celebrated with baskets of candy with our family, with small things. We even celebrated with children's pageants. Who knew that palm branches could become a full contact sport right here in the church? We celebrate these things. We know the details of the story. Jesus walks in today on Palm Sunday. He rides into Jerusalem, worships Hosanna, the king. 
And by the end of the week, he will be arrested and crucified. And then next Sunday, we will celebrate the fact that the grave could not hold him, that sin had been vanquished, that death is no more, and that Jesus is alive. And so we, we know the story of Easter. And so I've told you every week, and I tell you again, my heart is not to give you more facts about the Easter story. My desire is not for you to know every little detail about the Easter story. My desire is for you to love Jesus more. To know how much he loves you. To stare again at the death of the Savior, mangled on the cross, blood dripping down, and say in your heart, oh, what a Savior. That's the goal of the Easter season, to tune our hearts to a wonderful Savior. Would you join me in your copy of God's Word in, in John chapter 19? And, and let me just for a moment, we, we finished uh, with chapter 18 last week, looking at Jesus, uh, he was in the garden and arrested, and, and then he went before the Sanhedrin, and Peter denies him three times, and he's left all alone. And, and so I just want you to notice that I'm skipping ahead in the story. I don't, I don't want you that have been with me each week to realize we, we, we're skipping the mid part of chapter 19. So just by way of setting, let me tell you what's happened in this leading up to this. They have taken Jesus to Pilate because the Romans are the ones who are in charge of the death sentence. So they have to get Rome to crucify Jesus. The Jews were not allowed to carry out the death sentence once Rome took over the country. They could no longer stone people as the Old Testament had given warrant when laws were broken. And so they have to go to Pilate and they go to Pilate and they make up some charges against Jesus of insurrection. That he's trying to overthrow Caesar. That was not the charge. That is not the reason. We know he's sinless, but but they make it up. And Pilate goes back and forth. He's sent to Herod. He's sent to Pilate. Uh, Pilate goes out to the crowd during this time and says, I see nothing wrong with him. The crowd says, do you want us to go over your head and talk to your boss? Uh, Do you want us to go to the king and tell him how you can't handle Jerusalem, how you can't handle the Jews? So Pilate, in experience, realizes "I, I better squash this. And then you have the whole idea of Barabbas. They release one prisoner, uh, and so they they chant for Barabbas to be released, which is just phenomenal, because Barabbas, described in Scripture, is an awful criminal. He was one who was justly sentenced to die and should have died, and yet Jesus stands in his place. Just a side note there, is that not the gospel? Jesus stands in our place. We should have died, and yet Jesus died for us. Even in the picture of Barabbas, we have the gospel right in front of us, the good news of Christ standing in. Pilate will flog Jesus. This is the whipping with the the cat of nine tails that would rip the flesh from Jesus' body. And so we have all of that's taken place, and finally Pilate has agreed to sentence him to die. And that's where we pick up the story in verse 16. So he, meaning Pilate, delivered him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and went out bearing his own cross to uh, to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. In Latin, we would refer to it as Calvary. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross, and it read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read the inscription for the place where Jesus was crucified, was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, and in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priest of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write King of the Jews, but rather... This man said, I am the king of the Jews. And Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. I'm at verse 23. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts. One part for each soldier, also a tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven uh, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, so, so see who shall it be. This was to fulfill the scripture which says, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldier did these things. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother, and his mother's sister, and Mary, the wife of Cloopus, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And then he said to his disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her to his own home. Verse 28. After this, Jesus, knowing all that was finished, said, to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it up to his mouth. Verse 30, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it 
is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Let's pray together. Father, Lord, this morning, I pray you would remind us. You would remind us that while we know this story, while we have heard it, we have sung it in songs, we have recited it in poems, we have performed it in pageants, Lord, we pray, I pray, I beg you this morning, Lord, please remind us of the facts, remind us of the truth. We are to worship you in truth. We need to know what happened. We need to hear it again. We are hard-headed, stiff-necked people, and we need to hear it over and over and over. But Lord, I beg you, please, in the preaching of your word and by the power of your spirit, would you move it from our minds to our hearts? Would we go from intellect to affection? Lord, would we love you more? Lord, to be convinced even more that you are the one and only Savior and the hope of the world and in us would grow a confidence and a boldness to face whatever we face because the story is true. Because you are a good, good Savior. God, help us. Help us love you more. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. J.C. Ryle would write about this passage, and he would describe human hearts this way. He would say, he that can read a passage like this without a deep sense of man's debt to Christ must have a very cold or very thoughtless heart. This morning, brothers and sisters, I pray as we unpack this, as we see what Christ has done for us, as he has melted away our sin through his sacrifice, I pray this morning that your heart would not be cold towards the Lord Jesus who died for you. That you would see in his death the beauty and the wonder and the majesty of our Savior. That our hearts would not be cold, but they would be warmed to Jesus even more. We find in this passage Jesus Christ going to the cross. And we find in this passage, John will record for us three of the seven sayings that Jesus will have from the cross. Now the seven sayings of Jesus from the cross are very familiar to us. We've preached them, we've read them, we've heard them, we've dissected them. They're very famous words in all of eternity. The last seven things that Jesus would cry out before his death. John will record three of them for us. He will record him looking down at his mother and saying to John the uh, Baptist, his, his beloved friend, or excuse me, John the disciple, his beloved friend, and say to him, take care of my mother. We also hear Jesus say here in verse 29, I thirst. And so they reached up and gave him liquid. And then finally, it is that last word, and there in verse 30, that I want you to see this morning, where he will say, it is finished. John will give us three of the seven statements, and that last statement is the one we will draw our attention to this morning. But to get there, we need to understand what is happening. I want you to see this morning that when Jesus yells, it is finished, it is a way in which we understand that the God of heaven, the Father who has sent him, has accepted his sacrifice has accepted his death, has taken to receive the sacrificial lamb in which we needed, and all is settled now between the sin debt of man and God in our Lord. It is finished, is his cry. It is done. Nothing else is needed. No more uh, avenues, no more sacrifices. Christ is enough. And so I want you to see this morning this story in two parts. First, I want you to see the cross of Christ. I want you to see the cross of Christ. Let us just together walk through the crucifixion story here to remind ourselves so that we can understand the full weight of the words of Jesus when he says, it is finished. Let us go verse by verse together there in verse 16. The Bible records for us, John writes, so he delivered him over to be crucified. This is Pilate giving Jesus to the execution squad. He has decided to join in with the politicians. He has decided to join in with the Jews who have been murmuring for his death. They have come to an agreement. They have agreed that Jesus must die. 
They have bound together. It is interesting that the Jews and the Romans were not friends. They did not go well together. They did not play well together. Rome had conquered Israel. Rome had put its boot on the throat of Israel. The Jewish leaders did not like Rome. They did not want Rome in charge. They did not want to be controlled by Rome. But yet when it was time for them to get rid of Jesus, they became friends. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. They joined together in order to crush Jesus. And so the Bible says in verse 16 that they handed him over to be crucified. They gave him to the execution squad. Then you look there in verse 17. Notice how the story unfolds. And he went out bearing his cross to the place called the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. Now this is an interesting fact, but they were not allowed to crucify or kill inside the city gates. So they would move the crucified, the victims, out to the place of death. Now it is referred to as the place of the skull. You can Google this, though please don't do it during my sermon. Fact checking can be done after the sermon, all right? You can Google this, but ultimately scholars believe they refer to it as the place of the skull because literally the rock cliff outside of Jerusalem, if you look at it from a distance, looks like a skull carved into the rock. In Aramaic, it is referred to as Golgotha, and in then the Latin translation is where we get the word Calvary. But I want you to notice something about verse 17. It says, and he went out to the place of the skull. Now think about how interesting this is. Jerusalem is the city of kings. Jerusalem is the place where God established his permanent kingdom. They wandered in the desert with the tabernacle. They wandered with prophets. But once Solomon took control, excuse me, Saul took control, and then David, and then Solomon, you had a permanent resident in the city of Jerusalem for the kings of the people. Now think about the irony for a moment. The king of kings is not allowed to be in the city of kings. They send the king of kings out of the city. They send the prince of peace out of the place that is to be where peace reigned. Jerusalem is also referred to as the city of God, Zion, the city on the hill. Isn't it ironic that the city of God had no place for God himself? Isn't it ironic that in the pride and the foolishness of man, they took the very God who was in control and told him, you can't be king here, you can't be God here, get out. Now, brothers and sisters, that might sound callous and harsh, and to you and I, very, very foolish. But that is the picture of sin. That is what we have done in our own hearts. We come into this world rebellious of God for all of sin and fallen short of the glory of God, which ultimately means we have told the God of all creation, get out. We don't want you here. We don't want to follow your ways. We don't want you controlling our city of our heart. We don't want you sitting on the throne of our place. We want to do it our way. This is the picture of sin. They have sent Jesus outside the city. Notice with me what else it says. It says, there they crucified him. Now John will not give us the details of the crucifixion. He will just simply say, there they crucified him. But make no mistake, brothers and sisters. To the audience in which John is writing, to the people in which heard this, to the first readers of this report, to the first ones that John went and gave an eyewitness account to, when he would say they crucified him, all of those who heard this and read this would know exactly what it meant. They would shudder in horror because they understood just how terrible crucifixion was. Crucifixion is the worst form of death at this point that any person had ever seen in human history. In fact, many scholars would tell us that Rome was not good at many things, but one thing they were good at is perfecting how to kill people. They worked well at death. They were good at torture. And so they moved to crucify Jesus. What does crucifixion look like? Well, if you notice there in verse 16, it says they delivered him over to be crucified. And in verse 17, he went out bearing his own cross. They would lay the crossbar of the cross over his shoulders. They would affix it by ropes and have him carry it himself out to the hill of death, the place of the skull, the gathering of Golgotha, the mountain of Calvary. He would walk himself this walk of shame. He would stumble through the streets having his back already ripped open by the cat of nine tails. He would be spit upon and mocked. It would be a show for the city to see the criminals that were coming down the streets. It would be a public spectacle. 
shame. He would make his walk of shame out to this hill. Once he would be there, they would fix him to the upright bar. The upright bar would stand nine, ten feet at the most. Jesus' feet would be about this high off the ground probably. He would be hoisted up. They would drive nails through his hands and through his feet. His body would be contorted in such a way that it would be pain in every area mangled there. The vultures would pick at the carcasses. Many who were crucified would hang for not hours but days on the cross. While he hung on the cross, it would become excruciating, painful for him to breathe, lifting himself in order to fill his lungs with air. And instead of air being filling in his lungs, fluid would begin to fill his lungs. Asphyxiation would set in. He would begin to choke literally on his own fluid, standing there on the cross. And as he choked on his own fluids, he would begin to hallucinate lose his mind. The victim who was crucified would begin to find themselves going in and out of consciousness. John says he was crucified there, but the authors and the readers and the people who understood the story understood it to mean he would experience the most brutal death known to man. He would walk up that hill and die, and John just simply says he was crucified. The atrocious physical agony, the length of torment, the public shame, all combined to make the crucifixion the most worst part of death known to man. He would die there. He would die between two thieves. He would die as a criminal. He would die there. Isn't it interesting, though, that the Savior who come to die for sinners would die with sinners? Isn't it magnificent that the Savior would go where sinners are supposed to go so you and I don't have to? He would climb that hill of Golgotha and he would be placed there. And John writes, they crucified him. But I would just encourage you this morning with your pen in your hand and your Bible in your lap. You circle that word, they crucified him over and over and over and over. And you realize there is more in that word than we could ever understand. They crucified him. But it's not just the agony of the physical death that Jesus would feel that day. For the crucifixion was not just by the hands of men, but the will of the Father. And so Jesus would lay down his life on that cross, and he would not only feel the excruciating pain of the nails in his hands and feet and the fluid filling his lungs, but he would feel the excruciating pain of the Father himself pouring out the wrath on sin. He would feel the cold darkness of the sky as the Father looked away. He would feel the wrath of God as he became the curse for us. You see, brothers and sisters, physical death was not even touching what Jesus was feeling. He did not just feel physical death. He felt the death of damnation that sinners feel when they move from the presence of God into hell. He became the sacrifice for us. He was laid on the cross. Verse 18 They crucified him with two either on other side. Isaiah 53 said he would be numbered among the transgressors. He went like a sinner to the place where sinners die. The perfect lamb of God. The king kicked out of the city. The prince of peace tortured as one who is rebellious. Now notice with me verses 19 through 20 just to add insult to injury. Pilate also wrote the inscription and put it on the cross. And it read, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. The Jews had a problem with this because their whole point of wanting him to be crucified is that he claimed to be the king of the Jews, but they declared he is not their king. He is not the Messiah. He is not the Savior. He is not the one they are looking for. He is not the fulfillment of Daniel and Ezekiel and Genesis 3. They were determined to tell us that Jesus was not the right one. So they go to Pilate, if you notice there in the text in verses um, uh, 19 through 22, they go to Pilate and says, don't write that. Write he claimed to be. Right, he believed he was. Right, he's a liar. Don't write that. But I want you to notice what verse 22 says. And Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. Now you got to understand, Pilate is rubbing it in the face of the Jews. You came to me to crucify him. You don't have the power to crucify him. I'm in charge of this place. I will do this how I see fit. I will take back the reins of authority. You might act like a crowd and a mob that can get your will, but you're not really in charge. Pilate says, I'm in charge, and I have written what I have written. He says he's the king of the Jews. He is the king. He claims to be the king, so we're going to give him the title he claims. And we're going to write it in every language known to man in this city, so everyone will see this charge of insurrection. I want you to see something this morning from a different place in Scripture. 
I want you to see 1 Corinthians chapter 15 where Paul writes about the gospel. Paul was writing about delivering the gospel. And listen to what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15. For I delivered unto you of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scripture, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scripture. You know what that doesn't say? It doesn't say he died because Pilate said so. You know what that doesn't say? It doesn't say he died because the Jews raised a mob. You know what it says? He died because it was God's plan. Pilate thought he was in charge of the moment, and Pilate was a pawn in the sovereign God's plan. Jesus was always in charge. The Father always had the plan, and the Scripture always declared that he would die. And you know the irony of the moment? They wrote on the sign, King of the Jews, and dead gummit, it was true. That's Alabama English for those of you that, that don't know. It was right. He was the king of the Jews. They could have wrote king of kings and it'd be right. They could have wrote God in the flesh and it'd be right. They could have wrote the Savior, the sacrificial lamb, the Passover. They could have wrote Jehovah, Jireh. They could have wrote king and Lord and Messiah and Holy One and the great I am and the lily of the valley. They could have written it all and it would have been right. And they couldn't have a sign big enough to hold his name thought they were in charge but Jesus walked up that hill because God told him and he obeyed and he was always in charge he was always in charge Pilate thought he was the boss oh how foolish you know we only talk of Pilate because he's a footnote in God's plan we only talk of Pilate because he chose the wrong side with Judas. We only talk of Pilate because he's the antagonistic uh, character. But the hero is Christ, and Christ went to the hill. And Christ died on that hill. Now notice with me what takes place next. Look at verse 23. And when the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and delivered them into, and, and divided them excuse me, into four parts. One part for each soldier. Then also they took his tunic. Now, this is an interesting little caveat here. We find that they start to, to, to fight over his clothes, so they divide them up. Hey, you get his sandals. I'll take his belt. You get his coat. Hey, I like that sash that he wore that he would block the sandstorms with. I'll, I'll take the sash that he, that he had around his neck. But then they got down to his undergarment, the, the long one-piece slip that a Jewish man would wear under all of his garment. They got down to his tunic, and they said, whoa, this thing's nice. We don't want to cut this up. This ain't for washing the car on Saturday. We don't want to tear this t-shirt up, right? We, we don't want to do it. This is a good one. So instead of ripping it apart, let's throw dice for it. Let's gamble for it. Let's, let's play a game and see who wins. And notice what it says, verse 24. So they said to one another, let us tear it. Let us not tear it, but cast lots to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture which says, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots now why do we have this detail why does this matter why does it matter that we know they gambled for jesus's clothing well there are two reasons the first one is it is to remind us that this was an eyewitness account we are hearing what really happened because really people were real people were there watching it this is an eyewitness account we know the details that the soldiers divided his clothes and cast lots for his tunic because john was there to see it and he wrote it down so we would know we have an eyewitness account. Brothers and sisters, listen to me now. Don't miss this. The crucifixion and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus is a real event at a real point in history that really affects eternity. It is not an analogy. It's not an allegory. It's not a paraphrase. It really happened. And all of our hope is based on a real historical event of a real Savior who died. You are not saved by philosophy or religion. You are not saved by finding enlightenment. You are saved because a real hero died 2,000 years ago. We have eyewitness accounts. But secondly, and even more importantly, the Bible says that Jesus did it because Scripture said it. In fact, he is quoting Psalm 22. Psalm 22, verse 16 through 18, we read these words, For dogs encompass me. That's the soldiers, by the way. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. I am dying. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, 
they cast lots. You want to know something just mind-blowingly crazy? David writes this thousands of years before Jesus. And when David writes this, crucifixion's not even known to man. It's not even invented yet. He writes a poem about suffering. And he writes a prophecy that he doesn't even understand. That Jesus will scream from the cross. Why? Because God is fulfilling scripture. There are over 322, some estimate, prophecies of Jesus fulfilled in his life. Jesus fulfilled scripture. Do you realize that when Jesus got up the morning before he was arrested, before he went to the upper room to have bread and and the fruit of the vine with the disciples, before he instituted the Lord's Supper, before he went to the garden to get uh, arrested, before he was beaten by Pilate, before he was beaten and carried his cross, do you realize that all the way back that morning when he got dressed, he put on that garment knowing he's fulfilling Psalm 22? I just put on whatever my wife says matches. She's not home, you can tell. (laughs) Every detail. Every T crossed and I dotted. Jesus is fulfilling what we need. He's doing what is necessary. He even got dressed fulfilling scripture. The outfit mattered to Jesus. This is not some small detail. This is not he got close. Well, the Bible said this, but he was near it. He got near it. No, he fulfilled it. He did it perfectly. He did what you and I could not do. He held the scripture perfectly. And they cast lots for him. And now we see there, we, we need to pick up our pace. Look with me at verse 28 and 29. After Jesus knowing all this was finished, again, we have this eyewitness account. We have this fulfillment of scripture. He said, I thirst. Man, what a word. We hear in the word, I thirst, the agony of the crucifixion, the very need that his body is suffering on the cross. We hear in the word, I thirst, the fully man suffering, God for us, dying for a drink because his body is twisted and torn and broken. He's thirsty. He's in need. He's broken there. He's fulfilling scripture. Notice what it says. Verse 29, a jar of full sour wine stood there so that they put a sponge to it and they held it up to his mouth and touched his lips. He got a sip. And why did he get a sip? I want you to see the second part this morning, and this is where we will close, and that's simply this. He got a sip so he could cry out. I want you to see the cry of Christ from the cross. He got a sip of this wine, this sour wine, this vinegar almost in the jar. He got a sip of it so he could wet his lips, clear his throat, The other Gospels will remind us that he cried out with a loud voice. John will record what he said, and he will say these words in verse 30. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. Now you might ask yourself, what does that mean? Maybe it's just simply he's ready to die, and so it is finished. I'm done suffering. Maybe it is a surrender. I can't take anymore. It is finished. Maybe the devil heard it and thought he had won. Maybe the soldiers heard it and thought he had finally died. But I will tell you what it really means. It means that all that he came to do has been fulfilled. It means that the Father in heaven has seen his sacrifice, honored his death, and notice with me at the end of the verse, and he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. You see, there are two things that we must read in this word, it is finished. The first one is the work of redemption is complete. The work of redemption is complete. Christ has done for us what we could not do. In Hebrews chapter 2, the Bible tells us that he came to die in order to rescue us from our sin, our penalty. And so he came to do this. How will he do this? Well, when he yells, it is finished, he will say that the suffering is over. The sacrifice of the Passover lamb has been made. He has done what needed to be done. The way back to God has been established. Sin has been vanquished. The chains of death have been broken. The lamb has been accepted. The mindless years of goat after goat and bull after bull and bird after bird being sacrificed in order to help appease and and move people closer to God and, and avenge for sin could never do. A mindless goat could not take the place of willful disobedience. The man must. The sacrifice must. 
So Jesus goes to the cross, and when he screams, it is finished, he is declaring that suffering of sin is over. The sin has been vanquished. It has been broken. The chains of death will be no more. But the sacrifice is complete. When he says it is finished, he is refashioning the way to God. He has done all that is necessary. Not only do we have the way or the work of redemption is complete, but the way of reunion has commenced. By Jesus yelling, it is finished, he is also yelling to us, the door is open now, brothers and sisters. The way has been paved now. The path is now open. John 14, 6, Jesus would say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. And when he screamed, it is finished, he knew the resurrection was coming. And he's declaring to us that way, that path, that truth, the road's now open. You can come home. You can come back. You can be rescued. You may have put Jesus outside the city of your heart, but now because of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, he can come back. He is welcomed in. We have this redemption. It is the song of good tidings. It is the song of joy and hope. In this one word, it is finished. In this one statement, it is a declaration that Jesus has done what we could not do. Oh, in the it is finished phrase, the gospel is there. Hope is there. Joy is there. The answer for death is there. Heaven's entryway is there. This is the picture. This is the way. This is the coming to Christ. Romans 6.23 would write it this way. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of Christ, uh, excuse me, but the gift of God is the eternal life of Christ Jesus our Lord. I want you to notice something about this verse. There are two parts to this verse. There is the need for sacrifice for sin. The wages of sin is death. Death must take place for sin. Sin must be punished by death. And there needs to be a way back to God. And in Christ Jesus on the cross, God fulfilled both parts of that verse. God sacrificed his son so the death penalty would be met. God sacrificed his son so we might have eternal life with him. In Romans 6, 23, we see all of it is finished wrapped up in one verse. It is finished. It is done. He has finished it. Satan might have heard victory. The Romans might have just heard a sufferer finally quitting. But the Father in heaven heard a sound and accepted the sacrifice. And now we have a Savior. We have a Savior that has done what we could not do. We have a Savior that has reached where we could not reach. We have a Savior that has delivered us from a place that we could not get to. We have a Savior and He finished the task. You need nothing else to do but trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for He has done it. He has finished. This is why we sing, Lifted up was He to die. It is finished was His cry. And now heaven exalted high, hallelujah, what a Savior. He has done it for us. It is one phrase. It is one word, tetelestai. Tetelestai is the word, it is finished, it is the consummation, it is complete. Jesus would take the sour wine and touch his lips. He would gather enough strength. He would lift up his arms on his nails and his feet. He would scream in agony, but he would scream to telestai. It is finished. And in this word, brothers and sisters, this word is used in this time, this phrase. This word is used in history. When we find the word used during the days of Jesus' life, it would be used in three forms. One, it would be used as an accounting term to say, to telestai, the debt's been paid. Your bank account is cleared. It would be used in a judgment in a courtroom, to telestai, that is my final decision. I am done, you may go now, I have made the court ruling. And in Jesus' day, it would be used in the war field. Tetelestai would mean the battle is over, we have fully won. Do you understand what Jesus does when he screams tetelestai? He screams out to us, the debt is fully paid, the sentence is fully served, and the battle is fully won. It is finished. And there is nothing left to do. In the church... One of the great doctrines that we hold to is is salvation by grace alone. 
and maybe you're new to this idea, maybe you're new to Christian faith, maybe you're still learning and you're curious, and so I want to be clear and I want you to understand what we mean when we say that. We mean what Paul would write for us in Ephesians chapter 2, that we are saved by faith through grace, or we are saved by grace through faith. We can't boast that ultimately our salvation is nothing that we have done. It is not us walking down an aisle or praying a prayer, being baptized in a pool. It's not our good work, our good effort, that we do nothing in order to be saved. There is nothing we can do to commend ourselves to God. We are sinners separated from God, and we are in need of salvation, and God must do it for us. So we are adamant and clear that we do not work for our salvation. You cannot get good enough for God. You need someone outside of you. You need a hero to do it for you. You need a lamb who can die and come out of the grave. You need someone who can take your place. And that person is Jesus Christ, God in the flesh. For he is fully God. He could take the wrath of God. He could stand in perfection over the law. And he is fully man. He could stand in our place. He could atone for our death. We are saved by grace and not by works. You are saved by grace. You do nothing to earn your salvation. If you believe you have done something to earn your salvation, you do not understand salvation. It is a free gift of God to all who will believe. So listen and don't miss it. We preach and we proclaim that we are saved not by works but by grace. But listen to me now and do not miss this. We are saved by works. We are saved by the perfect work of the perfect Savior who died on the cross for you and me. It was a costly work. It was a sacrificing work. It was a debt-paying, sentence-fulfilling, battle-winning work. Our Christ went to the cross and died for us. Yes, I am saved not by my works, but by His works. For He has finished. To tell us I was His cry, and it is over. And so, brother or sister... Because Jesus has declared it is finished, you too can rest. You can come to Christ by faith. You can believe that his death, his burial, his resurrection finished it for you. That there's nothing left for you to do. You can by faith trust him and believe in him. You can, as Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ came and died. You can do as 1 Corinthians 15 where Paul said, I delivered unto you a first importance, that which I also received, that Christ came and died and was buried and rose again according to the scripture. You can believe that when Jesus yelled, it is finished, he meant it for you. And today, today you can come with all of your guilt and all of your sin and all of your shame and you can say, Lord Jesus, I know you finished it at the cross for me. Forgive me of my sin. By faith, I believe you are the hero today right now this moment it is finished can be your cry because of christ would you bow your heads with me this morning well i certainly hope you've enjoyed worshiping with us online what a blessing technology can be today as you heard god's word preached and as you sang with god's believers i i pray that the lord spoke to you in a special way In fact, I want to invite you to connect with us even more. Maybe today the Lord is pressing upon your heart a need for prayer. Maybe the Lord is pressing on you that you need to follow him in a more tangible way. Whatever the case may be, whatever the Lord may be saying to you, I I want you to know that Brushy Creek is here for you, that we want to help you in your walk with Christ. In fact, I want to invite you to contact our church office anytime, Monday through Thursday, 830 to 430, or you can email the the address you see at the bottom of the screen, and let us know that you worship with us. We'd love to know about you. We'd love to join you in praying for the things that are going on in your life and strengthen your walk. And as always, I want to invite you to come join us in person. Maybe it's been a while. Maybe you haven't been able to get out, but now you're ready. We would love to have you as a guest at our church service. Thank you again for worshiping with us. May God bless you.